Hello, everyone. Next speaker of the day is Ben Kidd, and he's going to show us the tools to survive and thrive in times of great opportunity. Hi. So, yeah, my name's Ben Kidd. Um, this presentation's uh, going to be hopefully quite interesting in terms of uh, sharing some ideas and sharing some thoughts, also sharing some of the work that we've done, um, uh, which is always good because it's nice to see other people uh, do for a living. So it's a pleasure for me to share it with you guys. So Hamilton Kid, that's our uh, studio. We're based in West London. Um, there's two of us, Tom Hamilton and Ben Kidd, and we produce CGI content uh, for television and uh, brands sort of all over the world really, anyone from Nickelodeon to uh, Rolls Royce and um, we've worked with companies that do anything from selling cars to children's TV adverts, so quite, quite a range. Uh, to give you an idea of what that looks like, uh, here's our showreel. So, uh, as you see there, there's, there's all sorts of bits, sponsorships, documentary graphics, it's quite a range of stuff. Um, so, the talk, the tools to survive and thrive in times of great opportunity. Um, when I mean tools, I'm talking about the software and hardware and also like the environment that, that we're in, uh, the, the services that are available to us. And, and talking about surviving and thriving, it's really saying that there are a lot of tools out there, there's a lot of accessibility to those tools, but um, using them, using them correctly, and also getting out through everyone else using them too, and getting out into the lead is quite tricky. So I wanted to touch on some of those subjects. So the tools of today is the first section I want to go through. Obviously it's not every single tool, otherwise we'd be here all week. Um, but uh, we just want to touch on some of the newer things and some of the more exciting things. Uh, once you've got those new tools, you're going to want to learn how to use them. Um, I'm self-taught, and so I'd like to talk about uh, the, some tips on, on how you go from not knowing how to use something to using something. And then move on to how we've been using the tools and show you a little bit of the application of that sort of, sort of thing. And then how to survive and thrive is kind of just going to, you know, weave through the whole the whole thing, and there'll be little tips that pop up, and they're just really uh, me just discussing the things that I've found and some tips and tricks, and maybe some things that um, would be new to you guys, maybe things that you agree with, maybe things you disagree with, but it'll be interesting either way. Um, I think this is a good way to start a discussion with this talk, really, and so. If at the end there's, uh, there's things that you'd like to discuss, then you know, tweet me, uh, go to the website, contact us. I'd be really interested to, to speak to you. So before that, establishing a couple of things. Uh, the, what are the tools? Like I say, we're talking about hardware and software and also the services and the environment that we're in. Uh, what are creatives? Well, specifically, this is talking from the standpoint of a creative, but I guess Creative doesn't necessarily have to be an artist. It could also, you know, be, uh, developers and programmers uh, and entrepreneurs are also very creative. Not necessarily in a purely artistic sense, but in terms of problem solving and coming up with, with new ways to do things. And tools are a big part of that. So on to the tools. So I couldn't really start this talk without mentioning uh, the internet. It's, 
<laughs> it's in here because I'd be a fool if I didn't mention it, but it's so vast that I'm not gonna have, uh, go and, and, and do a, a large section on it. But essentially, it is about the most useful tool I think mankind has, has probably developed, possibly since learning how to pull ants out of a tree stump with, with, with twigs. So we've, you know, we've, we're quite useful in that sense. Uh, it, it, it weaves its way through, I think, everything that we do these days, or, or at least it can do, and especially the tools, because from, ac from acquiring a tool to learning a tool to sharing what you've done with a tool, all is happening uh, through the internet. So I thought it was important to mention it, but you know, I'm not going to teach you to suck on eggs, so we'll move on. So a big part of our studio is, is workstations. The, the, the workhorses of, of, of what we're using to produce content. And um, what I wanted to discuss wasn't necessarily what ones to buy, what's good, what's not so good, but talking about actually um, the best ways to sort of utilize uh, the workstation field that's out there at the moment. We build all of our own machines, not too dissimilar to a way that a gamer would, would build a, a rig. Um, it's just we've maybe got some different criteria. Um, a lot of the time we're, we're uh, rendering out sequences of animation, say 100 frames, and it takes an hour per frame, and the client wants it in the morning. You haven't got 100 hours till the morning to get that out. So technology tools are going to allow us to get this content out to the client by the morning. So in because that's our priority, the best way to do that is rather than buying one ridiculously large machine that can try and do that, and probably there is a machine probably out there but it would cost you hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's a lot cheaper for us, for example, to buy 20 machines and it take you know, a lot less time, divide, dividing the, the workload by 20. Um, what that means for us is that if we look at it from the point of view of, of a curve of price and performance, we don't have to be up there, because up there is way too powerful in the sense that our software doesn't even actually divide up tasks well enough to be able to make the use of the power of, of the high-end machines. And the cost is massive. So what we found is by sitting where we need to sit, i.e. not too low or not too high, we can afford more machines. And, and like I say, because of the way that our software um, distributes uh, the task, distributes the processing, it's, it's useful to us to do it that way. If we were working in a different way, for example, we were looking at crunching numbers really quickly in real time, then it would be a different story. Um, we would be able to justify the, the higher powered machines. So the way that um, artists and creatives often are, uh, are inputting with, with these workstations, uh, keyboard, mouse, obviously, and Wacom Tagger. These are like our hammer and chisels. But actually, recently, things are, are moving on a little bit, and there's some new novel ways to, to interact with computers from a creative point of view rather than just a, a playful point of view. So you guys have all seen a Kinect, I would assume. Um, it's a very useful bit of kit if you're playing games. It's also very useful if you're uh, creative too because essentially it's giving you a new level of um, interactivity. It's a new way for the machine to read your movements. Uh, this is from the Xbox uh, One and this new Kinect has got facial tracking and, and facial recognition which means that it's possible now to be thinking about plugging your facial expressions into the way that you're interacting with your machine. Now, <laughs> smiling to make it work and not crash isn't going to work, but uh, it's an interesting idea. So Leap as well, this is a desktop-based solution. It's kind of similar to a Connect. Uh, I think it works along the same lines of technology, um, but it's allowing people to interact less directly with a machine, which, depending on your creative brief, might work for you. So the, the main tip coming off the back of that and, and what I actually want to, want to discuss with, with these input tools in, in general is to think laterally about what you need them to do. So for example, if you want to produce something very mechanical and very geometric and very sharp, then probably 
a keyboard and a mouse is going to be fine. But if you want to produce a piece of animation that's got some level of noise, some level of human to it, something that feels real, something that feels warm, or something that feels sharp and aggressive, or something that feels soft and gentle, you might want to start thinking about using things like Kinect, or recording your movements, or, for example, filming a camera around the room in order to capture that movement data and use that camera move inside an animation, so that inside the animation, the camera move feels very human. Um, and so, yeah, the idea is that before you get stuck into a job, maybe start thinking about can we animate this in a different way that's going to add a quality to it. So I've bounced through my, t uh, my points, but thinking things differently, different tools have got different effects, and sometimes the hardest way is the quickest way. If it takes you six months to develop a tool, that turns an hour's worth of work into five seconds, you have to justify spending six months developing that tool. Perhaps it's easier just to do it in an hour and then the job's done. So 3D printing, again, uh, I couldn't not talk about this really because for creatives it's opening up a, a lot of things before, you know, the, the most physical aspect of what uh, a, a, a designer or an animator could hope for would maybe be a printout or a DVD um, or perhaps getting your content up on a big screen which you know starts to feel kind of tactile when, when, you, when it's your work that's up there. But 3D printing now is totally opening us up as creatives to, to um, expressing what we, what we want to produce physically as well. So. Uh, this could be anything from a piece of art to a scientific experiment. The, the, the Formula One car here printed incredibly small. Um, this image here actually is, uh, is a sort of, what I like to think is extreme 3D printing. That's uh, metal 3D printing. That's actually printing titanium. And uh, there's a project that I want to talk about later on called the Bloodhound Project, which is the latest land speed record, which has actually got gearbox components that have been 3D printed. This is a machine that's going to be travelling at 1,050 miles an hour, and it's got 3D printed components within its gearbox, which is quite impressive. This is also something impressive, but not quite as fast. Um, this is an example of where somebody can express themselves creatively through 3D printing rather than just practically fixing something or designing a product, for example. Um, uh, this guy found a, a gap in the side of a rock, 3D scanned it with photography, which is, an, you know, you don't need uh, elaborate laser scanners these days. You, there's some really great software out there for 3D scanning just with an SLR. Uh, and, and has produced this novel 3D uh, um, print that matches colour, form, shape, everything to make this cornerstone look like a Lego brick, which I think is quite charming, actually. So if 3D printer is allowing us to produce um, physical objects, Arduino is allowing us to connect them together and make them talk, and make them talk with non-physical things as well. So you could be talking about connecting uh, devices to the internet so much easier than it would have done before. It's such, again, such a huge subject to touch on, but with this, with this uh, card, we can take devices, hack them together, produce prototypes, produce art installations, produce uh, ways of making vision and sound and uh, performance and input and recording in so many new ways. If you, if, if you know, if an artist has never coded before and picks up the coding language for this, it's really not that scary. I know because I was pretty intimidated by code up until recently, but with uh, diving into a bit of Arduino and messing around and producing sort of silly things around the home, I've, it's opened me into programming and, and sort of opened me into thinking about featuring microelectronics and hardware as part of what we deliver. It's quite exciting really because you know it's nothing new but it's accessible. The accessibility is new. The accessibility is fresh and I think that that's what's quite exciting. It's been a bit of a revolution um, in the last sort of five to ten years. 
this is really relevant if you're a filmmaker, uh, but it's not just about that. Uh, these, these cameras are re relatively easily affordable, but the way that they have uh, changed what uh, filmmakers and photographers can produce now on the budgets that they were only really able to hand have glorified handy cameras with, people are producing beautiful films with these now, and they're actually featuring in feature films because treated well, the, the, the footage is on a par with, with film. It's got limitations, but it's on a par. This is super exciting because it means that you don't have to borrow your parents' handy camera now to make a short film. You can be producing something really quite beautiful. Obviously, you need to know how to, how to use it creatively, but um, you, you're not we're not restricted by expensive tens of thousands of pounds cameras anymore. Oculus Rift, super exciting. Like We've got one back at the studio. We've been playing with it. Uh, we've suffered motion sickness a few times, but uh, it's a bit of a learning curve to see what does and doesn't work on it. Um, this is still in development. The exciting thing about this, apart from the hardware itself, which I'll just run a little demo of because I thought this was quite interesting. This is about as immersive uh, as I've seen it get yet. Obviously, this is a gaming, gaming platform. Form, I think, but um, this could be training. It, it could be. It could be anything. This isn't just about playing games. I think it's it's immersive, and immersive qualities can roll into anything. It could be, you know, a training thing, like I said, or it could just be that you know someone couldn't be here today and they want to feel like they're here, and we have some cameras rigged up. Then they could be sat at home, begrudgingly they'd rather be here, but they could pop on and and, and get a real sense of the space. Uh, it's just exciting in the sense that the way they're doing it as well. We can get hold of the dev kit, we can get hold of the SDK, we can bang it in Unity, and we can start producing stuff with it very quickly. Before now, VR, way too expensive, and you would have been developing the software yourself, inhibiting the creative process, I think. So Adobe, I don't know how many of you guys are using Adobe software, I imagine a few of you. This isn't about the software, I want to talk about the fact that the pricing on this has changed. Going back to accessibility, uh, accessibility being what's most exciting nowadays, as well as the tools themselves, this you can now pay monthly for. The, I think the amount of piracy that will have dropped significantly because for a lot of people, it was just prohibitively expensive to spend two and a half, three grand on software. When you're a student, you don't even know how to use it yet. Yes, they had demos and stuff, but they were 30 days long. You need more than 30 days to, to be messing around with something. If you're going to master something, it's going to take you years. This you can pay monthly with. I think the package that I use is 70 pounds a month, which as a business is, is nothing. It's like paying the electricity. Um, as a student, there are discounts and it's affordable. Point is, you don't have to be chucking out tons and tons of capital to get your software set up, to get your studio set up. And it goes back to the way that uh, I was talking about earlier with hardware and your workstations. The workstations are more accessible because they're cheaper. Uh, to, if, you, if you build them yourself or just purchase them outright, it means that, that people can get creative a lot easier financially as well as the tools being good too. I mean, they are bread and butter for, for designers and animators. Uh, these, uh, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with uh, digital sculpting, but it's one of the more pleasurable acts uh, of creativity these days. Um, it's like working with clay, to be honest with you. Um, it, it allows us to produce really organic things and it's, it's using, like, for example, a Wacom tablet, and there are some haptic inputs as well, like sort of arms and things that allow you to actually feel like you're touching the clay. Um, but it's allowing artists to do things much more expressively. I don't know if, like I said, I don't know how many of you guys have, have used, for example, ZBrush or Mudbox before, but if you have, you know that suddenly you, you feel uh, like what you're thinking is what's happening on screen. You, there's no sound of clicking and keyboards. There's no button pushing. It's you looking at the surface, carving shapes, carving patterns, carving texture into it. And, it, and, and apart from the software itself allowing us to produce beautiful things, the fact that software has changed the way we 
feel when we're interacting with it is what's exciting. We feel very uh, in touch with what we're producing. So Unity, um, very, very exciting um, for us because it plugs into a lot of the tools that we use. Unity game, de uh, game development uh, engine, um, well, I'll go back. We were wanting to break out of our animation constraints of producing a, an animated movie, and that was the constraints of what we someone could only really watch it or watch it again. That was the level of interactivity. So we started looking at, okay, if we wanted to produce something a bit more interactive or a game or an experience or something, what, what we do? I very quickly found Unity and very quickly found it um, incredibly accessible. Not only is it very familiar for me to use, i.e. I'm not, I'm not a programmer, so I'm not, I'm not uh, frightened by buckets and buckets of IDEs and software and uh, I'm, I'm sorry and, and, and coding languages that I need to learn. Um, it, this eased me in because it kind of felt very familiar to to software that I already used. So for artists, the fact that the the, the game uh, gaming industry are thinking about the way people want to use software in order to encourage them into it is very exciting. Um, we're using it to produce prototypes for interactive experiences. And, and also just producing some little games as well. We've sort of forced us into learning Java and, and C Sharp, uh, which is great because I didn't really have the urge to, 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 to start learning it before, but given that I could start producing quite exciting stuff using the software that I was already using, it was a bit irresistible. Um, we've already produced some gyroscopic first-person shooting games. We've produced some little puzzle games. We have uh, a project that I'll show you later, which is a kid's children's book that will be going on the App Store very soon. Um, all things that, without Unity knocking around, would have just been like, you know, suddenly I've got to completely change my career in order to, to, to go and learn something and be able to start producing interactive content. All that software is very familiar to us, which is great. And also, if we're experimenting, we want to mess around on my iPad, or we want to produce something on a standalone PC that gets built into an art exhibit, we have all these platforms we can mess around on, which is superb. And quite, quite often, you can switch from one platform to another, which is, which is great, without really too much recoding. Uh, here are some examples of where Unity is not being used for games. For, for example, um, uh, live events where you know audience participation or the speaker actually wants to do something a bit more dynamic rather than just pressing the right hand arrow key to move a slide on perhaps they actually want to use their body to drive what uh, what's on screen so on to sort of non hardware non software tools for example there's plenty of this and again it's a massive subject so I'm only really just going to touch on 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 an area that's relevant to us. Um, the Amazon Web Services is, 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 is an example of where um, we can expand our studio very, very quickly. We can have a render farm ready to go overnight. If we set up our um, clone of, of, of a render node and decide that we need 20 machines instantly that have got that exact software on them, it's a case of just duplicating it. Then it would be rendering and it would be producing our content and then uh, we would only pay for what we use, which is fantastic really because for me to buy that kit in for one job would be quite expensive and then I might not need that kind of specific kit for the next job. So being able to expand out to that is great. So crowdfunding um, is another non-software, non-hardware. It's more of a, I suppose, a platform it's, it's part of the environment that we're in. And what's exciting about it is that uh, if you've got an idea that you can't afford, you can hope that other people agree with you that it's a great idea and then fund you and hopefully afford it. I wanted to talk about it because I imagine you guys are quite familiar with it. Um, but I wanted to talk about it in terms of some of the ways you, that I think you sh would want to think about it because I don't think it's all a bucket of roses. It's not a case of just 
popping your project on there and hoping that you get 45 grand's worth of uh, investment and then you're away. I, uh, looking into it, I found that there was some issues with overfunding, <laughs> which is bizarre, and oversubscription to your idea, and that you might actually want to be thinking about preparing what happens if this explodes and, and 10 million people want this, and I only actually needed 20,000 people to want it. You could spend most of your time actually responding to their requests of why you haven't got time to respond to their requests. And there was also, for example, on Kickstarter, sometimes people would go on there and invest in something, but feel that actually they were just buying it. So they'd see an iPhone accessory, this is going to cost me 30 bucks to invest in, uh, and, I'll, and I'll have one of those by April kind of the wrong attitude because what the, the, the project is saying is look we think this would be a great idea we need your backing we need your support give us thirty dollars and if it works and it's done we'll send you a copy hopefully around April so there was a little bit of a mismatch between the attitudes between people who were investing and people who were um, bought, uh, uh, setting up the projects at the same time I think that there are issues that can be tackled I think it's just a case of being aware of them and um, again, rolls into social media because it's part of it. It's, it's social funding, I suppose. The social media, for us, as, a, as an animation studio, it's, if we do it right, it's free marketing. I can put my content out on the web. I can get a lot of attention. I can get a lot of peer feedback. I can get a lot of peers sharing it and appreciating it or actually the opposite, saying it's wrong and I can get a lot of feedback off of that. But also, you know, when clients, producers, directors, or clients right at the top of, of manufacturing companies decide that they want some communication, they'll have images in their head based on stuff that they've already seen. Now, if they know that there's something they've already seen that they liked, it's very easy for them to, if they've bookmarked it or they know how to find it or they know what it was called, to look it up, find exactly who created it, and go directly to that animation studio or print designer or, or whoever it is, really, uh, or developer. It might be a game that they're looking for and go straight to them. So it's your shop window. And I'm sure that this is, you know, uh, things that is nothing new, but I think that's what's... It's, it's, it's nothing new, but it's still in its infancy and it's still very exciting. Um, growth hacking is a really great way to start thinking about um, marketing. And I think personally, I think it's a bit of a rebirth of marketing. Um, marketing campaigns that you will see in print and that you will see on television will be supporting what's going on socially, not the other way around. And I don't think it's gonna take very long for that transition to happen. So off the back of those services, I guess my tip off of this uh, section is that there's things out there, there's tools, there's environment, there's services. It's key to understand them. It's really good to just decide that you're going to set up a Kickstarter campaign and then become a Kickstarter expert or Indiegogo or whatever, it, whatever the, the, the crowd uh, funding is. So know what you're getting into, I think, is, 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 a, is, a, is a good tip. So know the ins and outs of stuff. Research it, research it, research it some more. Imagine that your job is your Kickstarter campaign while it's going on. That is the, that, not the only thing, because you can have other things to worry about, but you need to almost obsess about making sure that it's as set up as possible. Because you're only going to do it once for that particular project. Or you, chances are you're going to want to do it once by the time you've finished. Um, why not give it your best shot? And I think the best way to achieve so anything, actually, is to research it. But particularly things that have got such social nuances that control them and influence them. Aim to be a master of anything that you are uh, wanting to, to get into. So the learning new tools. So we have touched on a few tools. There are tons out there. But let's just assume that you've found the tool that you're looking for. And uh, great, I, wanna, I, I don't know how to use Unity. And I know, that it's real, I know that it can do it. How the hell do I start learning Unity, for example? This is the journey we had. So there's all sorts of um, wonderful uh, websites out there that are producing tutorials and content and courses that you could physically attend or just that you could attend uh, virtually. But for me, I've survived off of these. 
FX PhD and Digital Tutors and Lehman Workshop have got me producing the showreel that I showed you earlier. It's taken me a good 10 years to get to that level, but it, but it wasn't through university and it wasn't through traditional education means that I learned. Now, I think I could have done it that way, maybe. Me personally, I found that teaching myself was the best way because uh, it was much more affordable. It felt a bit sort of um, wild, a bit rogue, and so it was quite exciting that I was personally exploring my way through this software and suddenly learning how to do something that you've taught yourself. It almost feels like you've discovered it or invented it. It really pushes you on. Um, there's some other ones up there as well, like Khan Academy. Um, Tom, uh, studio partner, found Khan Academy incredibly useful. It was a maths tutoring, um, and when he was learning uh, Java and um, Python, he found that the, the maths involved required a little bit more thinking to, to really get the most out of it. And Khan Academy was free, and he was able to do a lot of his uh, thesis research on uh, off of, off of there, which is great. So community is a big part. Once you've, uh, once you've learned your software, you've gone through tutorials, you're going to want to be experimenting and building things. It's totally the next best thing to be doing. Sit and watch someone do it, then start making it yourself. As soon as you start making it yourself, you've watched tutorials, you're absolutely sure you understood it. Within seconds, there'll be an error popping up or something you're doing wrong or something that's just not making any sense. You haven't got all of the answers yet. You don't know why is this doing this. It's part of the learning process. It hurts, but it's great to have those issues. Get stuck into communities. Unity has got a fantastic community. When Tom and I were developing our first game, we literally, every time an error would come up, every time something wasn't quite working, we could Google exactly the issue. It almost got to the point where we were just being even more and more specific and it was coming up with an answer every time. And it was like having a room full of people, a room full of developers that already knew the software uh, right behind us to turn around and go, hey, do you know how to set this up? Yeah, yeah, sure, just do this. It was great. So the tips on learning new tools. Teach yourself through watching others. It's a fantastic way of teaching yourself. It's really important to watch how someone else does it because I think you need to kind of translate how you would do it. And by watching someone else, you relate to how they do it and you can start imagining yourself doing it. Experiment with uh, what you've learned. So as soon as you've learned how to jump into ZBrush and start carving out a lizard, Get in there and start doing it and see what happens. You'll be surprised how many issues you bump into straight away, despite the fact that you feel like you've understood it. Definitely do not expect anyone in anywhere, whether it's at university, whether it's uh, on a course, whether it's a tutorial, to tell you everything you need to know. I reckon it's 25 to 50% of the information that you need to, to, to do what you want, because remember what you want is something quite specific, and if you're creative uh, and, and, and try, uh, an artist and you're trying to produce something that hasn't been done before, there's a good chance that no one else knows how to do the other 50%, so no one can teach you that. So I think I'd probably apply this rule to pretty much everything, let alone being creative. Don't expect people to, don't expect to just be able to go out there and get all the answers. You're gonna have to generate some of the answers yourself. Um, I wanted to talk about the fact that obviously I've touched on a lot of digital and computerized um, forms of creativity and, um, and art, but I bumped into this studio, I was in Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago, and I walked past this shop window and it caught my eye straight away. And I looked through and I saw these two guys working at the back, and I went through and it was jewelry at the front and their studio at the back. And it was wonderful. The, I started chatting to the guys. They've set up the shop about two years ago. You can get their link up there. They produce stunning jewelry. They're experts in what they do. They're passionate about what they do. They love their shop. If you would walk in there, you really get a sense. Their, their, their shop oozes the values of their 
jewellery that they're producing and their studio and their methodology of working and the way that it's exposed uh, really shows through their work and adds value. And I think that this is part of something I'm going to talk about towards the end, but uh, I just wanted to set it up now so you know what I'm talking about when I'm saying about adding value by um, enjoying what you do and thinking about not just going out and looking for a job where you get to make jewellery. I'll touch on it later, but I wanted to show you this. So how are we using the tools? So a bit of content. So this is a movie that we worked on. Uh, I recommend you check it out. It's quite a funny film, quite touching as well, actually. It's a zombie movie, sort of. Um, this was shot on cameras that we were talking about earlier, Canon uh, 7Ds. It was one of the first films in the UK, feature films in the UK, to be shot exclusively on a, on a, on a 7D or 5D. It was one of the two. Um, as you can see, it's got a, it's got a quality to it uh, that's not exactly um, uh, shiny Hollywood, but that's exactly what they were going for. And it gave them the ability to shoot it very quickly, very cheaply. And this film is doing really well in the States. It's doing really well um, online. It's, it's in supermarkets. It's got lots of great reviews. It's been winning awards. And it's something that the director wouldn't have been able to produce without the, 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 the tools available to him. Obviously, we're talking about social media as well. We're talking about hardware and software. So this is quite exciting for us because uh, yes, no. Sunday morning uh, was the was the broadcast of some Lego sponsorships that we've just finished working on. Uh, it's quite exciting for us to be working on Lego because, of course, we've grown up with Lego and actually it really f feeds into who we are and what we do. It's about for us. It was about making things at an early age and and getting a kick out of it as what's pushed us into having our own animation studio. So when that quiets down. Uh, let's get some audio on this. This is Aquagon. Lego Hero Factory sponsors breakfast on CITV. Assembled for action. Stormer versus Frost Beast. Lego Hero Factory sponsors breakfast on CITV. Assembled. Four, action. Jet Rocker versus Dragon Bolt. Lego Hero Factory sponsors breakfast on CITV. Assembled. Four, action. Surge versus Dragon Bolt. Lego Hero Factory sponsors breakfast on CITV. So yeah, they're playing out on um, CITV in the mornings while kids are eating their cereal. Um, we're we were quite excited to work on this. It's Lego, it's fighting robots. Um, here's a little bit of a breakdown of, of how we're producing these. Um, so we received the, the Lego uh, models. Thankfully, they already exist. We didn't want to have to model them. We animated them, produced an environment, lighting, setting up shaders, getting everything looking beautiful, get it rendered out. And then in post-production using uh, Adobe After Effects, we are uh, adjusting the colors and adding lots of effects, like you can see the, 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 the particle effects, it gives us the final result. We wouldn't be able to produce this kind of content on the budget that we're working on um, without uh, the accessibility of the hardware and the software that we have at the moment. So Tom and I are getting up there uh, with, the, with the highest production values through utilizing the right tools at the right time. Moving off of Lego, onto uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So we, we finished the Lego job, great. We're bang into a turtles job, which is another childhood favorite of ours. This is known as a stuff spot. So this is when you, you, know, you get an advert on television. Um, it's just trying to sell your kids stuff, basically. Um, some of it I wouldn't mind myself. Uh, so. Again, similar principles, the way we've worked, same sort of software, 
the tools are allowing us to produce something very quickly. I think we turned that around in uh, just under two weeks between two of us. And Tom did a majority of that work himself. Um, I've got a bit of kind of like behind the scenes, if you like. Um, this is our camera move and our environment that we ended up developing in order to produce that sequence. You can see that the graphics weren't uh, in the 3D environment. The graphics with all the um, toys and prices and stuff all featured uh, in After Effects. So our workflow isn't just all in one software. It's a bit of a pipeline. You've got pre-production, storyboarding, 3D rendering that out and then working in post-production software like After Effects in order to give you the final result. So Bloodhound, I mentioned it earlier, this is the thing that's got uh, additive manufacturing involved. This is insane, I don't know if you guys have, have seen this car before, but essentially it's going to do a thousand miles an hour on average, they want, and uh, it's got a EJ2000 uh, jet engine at the back at the top and a rocket underneath. So, so it's quite a powerful bit of kit, really. Um, the fuel that, that the oxidizer, sorry, that um, is required for the rocket is actually pumped using a cruise missile uh, fuel pump, and that's being driven um, by a Formula One engine. So we've got a jet engine, cruise missile pump, Formula One engine, and rocket all inside this vehicle with a guy sat at the front piloting it. Because if a land speed record is to be true, uh, it requires a pilot and it requires four wheels. Andy Green is the, is the guy who's going to be driving it. He's current land speed record holder at the moment as, as well. Um, he produced the Thrust uh, SSC uh, record. So this is a film that we produced for Bloodhound. And um, again, using our cheap render farm that we built by, by producing uh, home-made uh, machines, producing, uh, using the right software, allowed us to maximize what we could give Bloodhound for their project. They didn't have a huge budget. There's a lot of this involved in this that is, uh, Tom and I were knowing that by adding value to it, it was gonna come back to us by having a nice piece of work to, to, to end with. Um, but we couldn't have produced this if the software was difficult to use, if the, if the hardware was too expensive or the software was too expensive. And we couldn't have learned how to do this without the tutorials and the, the communities that are out there. So there's just some uh, production stills. So we had to produce all sorts of like mechanical bits and bobs and rockets and, and liquid. We had a driver that, to, to produce. Um, this is one of the games we'd worked on. Um, this is called Mossy Forest. It's a children's book and will feature uh, in the App Store very shortly. Um, I wanted to just feature it to show that uh, this animation is produced in After Effects and we built a pipeline that would go between After Effects and Cocos 2D and has allowed uh, the developer to not have to worry about the animation and the animators to not have to worry about the developing and both teams have got their skills and um, through researching online through tutorials, through open source bits of kit that other people have produced software, we were able to build this pipeline. Not something that would have been very easy to do before. So now you can survive, you can thrive. So uh, things that are gonna, once you've got yourself going, you've learnt your tools, you're producing nice stuff, still not the end of it because you need to get ahead of what everyone else is doing. If it's so accessible for you to do it, it's gonna be a good chance it's gonna be accessible for everyone else. Things that are going to make you stand out are doing things because you want to do it, doing things because you have a passion for building it. It's easy said. I think as a lot of people here, of all the audiences, you're going to already understand this, but I wanted to make it as a point. Communication is really important. Of course it is, like communicating with the people that are commissioning with you, communicating to people that you're hoping to sell to is super, super, super important because that's how they're measuring it. Someone could offer you something amazing, but if they're you know, not very good at communicating when they offer it to you, you're already turned off. Uh, I think it's important to aim with peripheral vision. And what I mean by that is if you want to produce a computer game, that's your goal. If you stare at it long and hard enough, it's going to make it very difficult to achieve. It's like they say, the watch pot never, never boils. If you know you want to um, 
produce a computer game, do everything around it that's involved with producing a computer game or producing uh, jewellery or producing anything really. You'll expose yourself and along the way you'll find that the route you thought you were going to take initially, there's a better one. So cottage industry, I just want to quickly talk about that. Um, it's something that I, I kind of think is, is, is coming back. Uh, the ironic loop that I'm talking about is the fact that the machine killed the cottage industry. People were in their homes weaving, producing uh, wheat, producing goods that were then purchased all together and sold out through a market. But everyone was doing this. It wasn't in factories. People were doing it within cottages. The machines killed that because it put it all into factories. The ironic loop is the fact that the machines gave birth to computers, computers gave birth to what we have today, and actually, cottage industry is coming back. Tom and I can work from our studio, which is quite close to our home, and we can be producing some really high-end, serious work. There's an added value to working like that. It's personal, it's passionate, it's bespoke. It's low risk because it's low overhead, and it's scalable, so once your idea is working, you can make it as big or as small as you need to. Perhaps by using something like Kickstarter would take your small cottage industry into something massive. The cool thing about it is there's little or no commute. Just the journey here, <laughs> I'm in West London, but just the journey here was enough for me to know how important that is. So my final thought, to sort of wrap it all up, would be that creating your place in society. So what I'm saying is that with all the tools, with everything that's available to you, it isn't just a case of creating something cool. It isn't just a case of producing something that you can sell for millions. It's something, it's a, there's an opportunity here that you can define and create your, your, your place, your role in society, which is, which is great. It's, you know, if, you, if that's, I think, your aim, that you just, you know that you're, you're gonna, you want to be able to produce the best 3D printed accessories that help um, disabled people around their homes. Go for it. That hasn't necessarily been done yet. And if you were to uh, decide that that was your goal, go for it. Do it well and it will make money. Do it in the right way and it will reward you. But make the reason you do it as part of you, as part of your expression for doing something, not just so that you can sell it in a year uh, and, and not just because you think it's going to make you rich. Often aiming for those things can throw you off because you're not looking at the, the essence of what it is that's going to make it successful. So um, connect with us if you like. Um, again, my name's Ben Kidd. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter there if you'd like to um, ask me any questions or if there's any comments that you'd like to make or if you'd like to continue discussion. Um, I, I invite your feedback and I thank you very much for, for enjoying my talk. Thank you.